Good afternoon. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to this conference on the presidency and civil rights. As you know, the National Archives is charged with preserving and providing access to our nation's most important documents. The records we safeguard are part of the backbone of our democracy, important pieces of the story of the American journey. They contain accounts of heroism and tragedy, of moments of pride and moments of shame, of sacrifices that men and women have made to defend our country and to extend basic human rights to all of our citizens. This library and 12 others like it around the country contain the records of the presidents dating back to 1929 when Herbert Hoover lived in the White House. They're part of the, nation, the National Archives' vast holdings that tell the story of America. Our holdings also include the Charters of Freedom, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights, which are located in the rotunda of our main building in Washington. But we also have 12 billion more pages of documents, not to mention the millions of photographs, maps, charts, and billions of electronic records and artifacts that are part of the National Archives. Now, you don't have to read and study many of them to realize that the story of America is a story of people struggling to achieve the rights promised in the Charters of Freedom or protesting because they have been denied those rights. It is, of course, the Constitution and its amendments that presidents have used to underpin major actions and upon which the United States Supreme Court has based so many landmark decisions involving civil and human rights. The list is daunting. Franklin Roosevelt outlawed discrimination by wartime defense contractors through the Fair Employment Practices Committee. Harry Truman ordered an end to segregation in the armed forces during the historic election year of 1948. Dwight Eisenhower sent army troops to Central High in Little Rock so African American students could enroll. John Kennedy put the power of the federal government behind the effort to integrate the University of Alabama. Lyndon Johnson pushed Congress relentlessly to enact the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. This city has played a pivotal role in these struggles as the cradle of our democracy at our nation's founding, as one of the centers of the abolitionist movement, and more recently at the heart of the debate over how best to desegregate its public schools to comply with the historic 1954 Supreme Court decision in Brown versus the Topeka Board of Education. These struggles for civil rights have not always been easy. When they occur, they often revolve around the Constitution, where the rights that define us as a nation have always been secured. The first 10 amendments to the Constitution are known as the Bill of Rights. They spell out the personal rights and freedoms that are guaranteed to every American, including freedom of speech, religion, and the press, the right to petition the government, the right to bear arms, and the right to due process of law. Most of the later amendments sought to explicit, explicitly extend rights granted in the Constitution itself to individuals who had been excluded from full participation in our democracy when the Constitution was adopted in 1787. Three post-Civil War amendments abolish slavery, make former slaves U.S. citizens, and grant them the right to vote. The 19th Amendment grants women the right to vote, and another grants access to the ballot by 18-year-olds. We may view these founding documents as timeless, but the government they envisioned and that we inherited was not inevitable. It required the devotion of citizens like you and me, a national respect for the rule of law, and the wise exercise of power by our elected leaders who are held accountable by we the people. As I mentioned before, the holdings of the National Archives chronicle our nation's efforts to live out the ideals expressed in the Charters of Freedom. They document President Abraham Lincoln's wartime proclamation that emancipated the slaves to the signing a century later of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that sought to end legalized segregation. Many of our documents are housed throughout the country. In this building, in one of our regional archives in Waltham and in 42 libraries and regional archives around the country. Understand the, under, understanding the stories surrounding the actions by our president helps us give context to Martin Luther King's observation that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. 
It bends not on its own, Dr. King said, but because each of us in our own way puts our hand on that arc and we bend it in the direction of a more just world. I'm proud that the Kennedy Library is hosting today's conference and recognize and thank all of those who have put together this terrific program. I'm not allowed to say this in public, especially in the presence of my friends from the FDR Library, but this is, having grown up in Beverly, Massachusetts, this is my favorite presidential library. <laughs> I cannot think of a better day or a better place to mark President's Day. I also want to personally thank all of our speakers, many of whom have traveled far, including one from South Africa, to be with us here for these proceedings. And a special welcome to those who are watching us around the world on C-SPAN. I'm especially pleased to see so many young people and students in the audience today. Those of us who lived through the Kennedy presidency now prepare to pass the torch again to a new generation of Americans, knowing that the fate of our country and the rights we hold so dear will lie in your hands. In considering our future, I'm reminded of the famous words President Kennedy used in his inaugural address. He not only challenged us to ask what we can do for our country, he also observed that his election signified that the torch had been passed, and I quote, to a new generation of Americans who were unwilling to witness or permit the slow undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed today at home and around the world. It's now my great honor to introduce the man who will officially open our proceedings, the 41st President of the United States, George Herbert Walker Bush. Let me start by saluting our friends at the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum for launching their JFK 50 Justice for All program. I'm particularly happy to single out Carolyn Kennedy and Todd Putnam, as well as Brigham McCutcheon and Jay Zimmerman for making this program a reality. Your topic strikes a real chord with me. As a young congressman from Texas, I well remember the open housing vote back in 1968. I voted with those who were fighting to give Americans of all races and creeds the chance to buy a good home in a good neighborhood. Later, as president, we got the Americans with Disabilities Act passed to make sure that tens of millions with disabilities had fuller access to the American dream. Of course, these two instances are only part of the broader struggle for civil rights. Here at this forum and, and in other programs, you can learn how and why so many Americans across this great land came together for a noble cause. Basic human dignity, equal opportunity under the law, recognizing our diversity as a strength and a blessing. These are the values that define more than a movement, but a nation realizing its destiny, our potential for greatness. Barbara joins me in sending our best wishes for an informative and enjoyable event. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all so much for coming. On behalf of my colleague, Tom McNaught, Executive Director of the Kennedy Library Foundation, uh, I want to especially thank the Archivists of the United States for being here and opening our proceedings. Uh, I also want to thank the law firm of Bingham McCutcheon, who are the underwriters of a special initiative called JFK 50 Justice for All, uh, and they've helped to uh, sponsor today's conference. Uh, I'd also like to thank our media sponsors, WBUR, and the Boston Globe. Now, we could have a whole hour and a half or a whole conference on uh, Franklin Roosevelt and civil rights, and you'll see from your schedule that we only have about 20 minutes to do that. And I was uh, suggesting to Alita, that, who is an expert on both Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, that their courtship lasted about two years, and trying to cover this topic in 20 minutes is a bit like the modern phenomenon of speed dating. Uh, <laughs> so we'll do our best to cover this topic uh, fortunately, Alita is not only a wonderful storyteller, but she's a very fast talker. Uh, so. Uh, so Alita, there's a debate among historians, really, about Franklin Roosevelt and civil rights. Um, and maybe you, you know, when he uh, came, um, became president, 
Uh, he faced a country that was not only facing depression, but uh, was a segregated uh, nation. Uh, and like uh, President Kennedy and others, uh, he faced uh, conservative leaders in Congress and within his own party. Uh, mm -hmm. And so as he was trying to put forth legislation, if he moved too quickly on uh, integration, in terms of some of that legislation, uh, that could have held back some of his other legislative uh, mm -hmm. accomplishments. So give us the quick gloss of Franklin Roosevelt uh, and civil rights. This is like doing my whole life in 15 seconds, just so you know. <laughs> Well, um, I think first of all, we have to remember that the Democratic Party was profoundly Southern and a Western Party. And so when Roosevelt comes into office, he has not yet realigned the party to become the party that we all know today. But it's, so it's, it's quite interesting to me that some of the things that immediately happen with the staff that he picks. I mean, you immediately integrate, and I use that word deliberately, you abolish segregation in federal cafeterias in the Interior Department and in other places, when in fact D.C. is a profoundly segregated city and was segregated by a Democrat, Woodrow Wilson. So his appointments, um, I think, are quite interesting in that way. You've got Harold Ickes, you've got Harry Hopkins, you've got Aubrey Williams, and of course you have the incomparable Mary McLeod Bethune, whom before September 11th I used to lump with Eleanor Roosevelt and say they were the Twin Towers of the, you know, of the pre-war civil rights movement. So there's, there's a huge um, um, risk-taking mindset there. Now, does that mean that it goes as far as we want? No, but I, um, I've, I've been all over the map on this, and I have come to a very Eleanor-like conclusion, and that is you can look at a glass and you can see it half empty, or you can see it keep, the water keep increasing. And what I think both Roosevelt's did was really introduce um, to America the concept that the federal government was not just for the forgotten man or for the forgotten woman, but as FDR said when he spoke at Howard, not only will there be no forgotten men, there will be no forgotten races. So we have, um, we have policies, um, we have the two executive orders that FDR issues, one um, for the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, that outlaws um, segregation in WPA hiring practices. And then you have the Fair Employment Practices Commission doing that for the defense industry. Now, do they work? No. Do they help some people? Yes. Is there a long way that we have to go? Yes. Do we still have to do it now? Yes. But when you look at this, I want you to remember that they were the first executive orders passed or any type of federal legislation since Reconstruction, which I think says a lot. Also, if you look at the risks that they took in terms of um, setting up the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department, and um, although I'm supposed to talk about FDR and my colleagues at the Four Freedoms Project will expect me and pardon me, as will the FDR library people, to say that you cannot talk about FDR and race without talking about Eleanor. And Eleanor traveled without Secret Service protection. There were assassination attempts on her life, not threats, attempts as First Lady. The Ku Klux Klan places the largest bounty in history on her head. They firebomb trees next to um, revolutionary era churches that she spoke in in North Carolina in 1937, 1938, when she's talking about the poll tax. She joined Polly Murray in chairing the National Commission to abolish the poll tax. And so there were profound risks that were taken. And um, if I may um, sort of goad friendly, with great respect, my colleagues who write on this, for once, just for once, please, as a favor to me, when you write about FDR and you write about race, will you please say that people were trying to kill his wife and that she could have shut up if he said to her, on this you will not cross me, like he did in internment? There's a huge difference here. And the untold story of the Roosevelt's in race which I would, if I could ever go back and be a fly on a wall and engage in the what if school is history moment, would be the conversations that they had one-on-one -on -one about the risk that she was taking to aggressively change her position from being truly separate but equal, but moving toward integration. And so by the time that Gurner Murdahl and Ralph Bunch do their landmark study, um, 
uh, The American Dilemma, Ralph Bunch will say, of all the people that I have inter interviewed in the United States, the person on whose sincerity I have no doubt is Eleanor Roosevelt. Now, when you get to the war, which I guess we'll talk about, you'll really see the impact there. But, um, and the other thing about, do we all want anti-lynching past? I mean, I grew up in Memphis. You know, I'm that chunky white child on the back of the wall, you know, in 1968 when Dr. King was given the mountaintop speech. I mean, I was two blocks away when he was assassinated at the Lorraine Motel. It changed my life. You know, I, I, nobody on the planet wants FDR to engage in the anti-lynching legislation more than I do. But let's look at 1934 and let's at what Du Bois says when FDR calls lynching murder. He's the first president in the history of the United States to call it murder, and W.E.B. Du Bois editorializes about it on the front page of the crisis. Although FDR does not support the legislation in 35, 36, 37, or 38 when it comes up, by 1938, Eleanor Roosevelt spends seven days sitting in the gallery of the United States Senate. And, people, and she's surrounded by civil rights leaders, all people of color. When they ask her what Eleanor is doing, she says, I am bearing witness. And that, to me, is a powerful, powerful statement. So you have to look at, um, granted there was no legislation passed, but there were internal policies changed, there was Eleanor's outspokenness, there was her literally putting her life on the line for this, and there were executive orders written and the Justice Department created. So I look at his record as a huge step forward to help jumpstart where we want to be. So was that good in three minutes? <laughs> I've never done it this fast. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> okay. So now let's move to another small topic. Uh, so uh, the desegregation of the armed forces. We have a panel that's going to talk mm -hmm. about President Truman. Mm -hmm. uh, but where did FDR stand? And I think uh, it be of interest to people that, you know, we've seen the recent movie on the Tuskegee Airmen. Mm -hmm. did, did he know those stories? Or what was his, obviously his sure. main intent was to win the war, yeah. but how did he face this issue? Well, the FDR time? always thought that the primary responsibility was to win the war. There was never any, any doubt in his mind about that. But FDR did instruct the War Department to, in fact, um, allow, to remove the barriers that were placed um, in front of African Americans who, in fact, wanted to enlist and serve. At this point, 9% of the population was African American, less than 1% were allowed to serve in the United States military. Now, for those of you who may be suspect of propaganda, and people say, oh, only 1% of African Americans served in the draft, there were laws that prevented people from enlisting. And so FDR worked with the War Department, who was profoundly opposed to this, to, in fact, remove barriers. It didn't work that much. It went from 1% to 5%, as opposed to 9%. But if you go back again, the glass is half full. Um, there were, when, um, when, when FDR meets with A. Philip Randolph and Walter White and leaders from the Urban League, it's the, to discuss this, it's the exact same day that the Tripartite Pact is announced. So that means at the same time he's learning that Germany, Hitler, and I mean, Germany, Japan, and Russia have all signed a pact to come against us. And when Randolph and company come, they come in a meeting that Eleanor has facilitated, and they have a list of seven demands. Of those demands, four are met. The full integration of the service is, is not met, obviously, because that's left for Truman to do. But the steps that FDR does take, I think, are, um, are not just incremental, but are a slap in the face. He has gotten rave reviews for changing his cabinet and bringing in a new Secretary of War and a new Secretary of the Navy. They're Republicans, it's supposed to be a bipartisan candidate cabinet, and they are absolutely, adamantly opposed to any activity that will advance Negroes through the ranks. Stimson says he will resign. He, I mean, Stimson says, Leadership is not embedded in the Negro race. He's Secretary of War. 
the Secretary of the Navy, Cox, I mean, Knox, says he will resign if, in fact, this happens. So what does FDR do? Well, he brings um, uh, the dean of the Howard Law School in to be Stimson's aide. He appoints a colonel to advise, the, an African-American colonel, to advise the selective service, and he gives um, um, Stimson uh, um, an African-American general, the first African-American general, to, in fact, ride sort of roughshod on them. The big obstacle in this, however, is George Marshall. And if you're going to look at who's going to block a lot of stuff, FDR doesn't push hard, but Marshall really is the one that says, come down and says, not on my watch, we got to win the war. But Eleanor um, works to help get the 99th Squadron, the Tuskegee Airmen through. She works to um, have African-American women um, who want to become waves and nurses do this. There's a riot in that. Eleanor actually goes to the city uh, when the, the, the night after the riot to try to calm things down, stays with the waves and insists, in fact, that the swimming pools that they're in to train in be integrated so that they can have the same um, training that their white counterparts are. So it's, you know, it, it's complicated. Let's go to another complicated issue, which is uh, Japanese internment. I mean, so the, probably the case most in our history where yeah. you know, the federal government actually uh, yeah. imprisons people based on rest, race and ethnicity. Well, I wouldn't say it's the first time, but I would say it's one of the major times. Um, there is no doubt um, in my mind that FDR considered that the emergency of wartime overrode civil liberties protections. I mean, there's just no doubt in my mind about this. Um, I mean, he looked at Lincoln, he looked at a lot of precedents, I mean, he knew immediately. It was um, a decision that was greatly opposed within the administration. Um, Eleanor, for one, strongly opposed it, as did the Attorney General of the United States, Biddle, as did the um, military command in Hawaii, as did Justice William O. Douglas, who um, really violated um, legal protocol, if you will, when he met with Eleanor to advise her on arguments to um, present to the president. But FDR, I, I think the best book on this really is a shout out to my friend Greg Robinson, whose book um, by order of the president really is hands down, I think, the, the best um, study of this. And I think Greg is, is absolutely right that, that FDR did not think it through in the sense of thinking there would be long range questions of patriotism or, um, you know, or suspicion of people or really um, understand the, uh, the theft of property that, that went on. Um, and so when there is a riot in the Manzanar camps and in Gila River in July of, um, I mean in the summer of 1943, um, he, he sends Eleanor out to, to meet with them. And, um, and I know that uh, they had numerous conversations on this. There's not a shred of paper anywhere in the world on it. I give you my word, I've looked for it since the day that I was born. <laughs> you know, and, and it's not there. But I strongly suspect that there were countless conversations about this. Um, Eleanor wanted to adopt Japanese American families to get them out of the camps. She wrote countless letters. Um, just to attesting to people's patriotism. She facilitated their entry into the war. And so there were, I um, would stake my mortgage and my soul on the fact that there were conversations about this that we'll never be privy to. And let's end with uh, you giving us the backstory to the iconic uh, concert that Marian Anderson gave at the Lincoln Memorial. Well, I love Eleanor Roosevelt. I love Franklin Roosevelt, there are pictures in every room in my house, but we have to give Harold Dickies a shout out. You know, because he's the one that really got the Lincoln Memorial. But what we need to give both Roosevelt's credit for is um, Eleanor's understanding of how to use her newspaper column, My Day, to turn this concert in from a local, i.e. regional Washington, D.C. slap in the face to turn it into a national civil rights event. When Eleanor resigns from the DAR on February 27th, 1939, that column goes on the front page of 483 newspapers. 
and Marian Anderson stays on the front page of 483 newspapers for seven weeks. And it's Eleanor who, who goes to the radio programs to say, you, you know, basically in polite Eleanor language, which I will never in my life ever be accused of having, is to say, you know, that if you want me on the radio, you need to carry this. And so it's Eleanor's pressure on the radio stations that make it the first live coast to coast nationally broadcast radio event in the history of radio. She also works with Walter White to um, schedule the concert at four o'clock in the afternoon so that churches around the country, African American churches in particular, on Easter Sunday can have picnics. And she suggests to Walter White that perhaps they can make arrangements for those um, collections that are kept to in fact be donated to the NAACP. And the collections that are raised that day are the second largest donation in the history of the NAACP, only surpassed by Duke Ellington's national concert tour when he gave the proceeds to that to the NAACP. She also um, had, before the, um, the debacle that uh, was uh, the insult to Marian Anderson, Eleanor had invited her to the White House. She'd stayed in the White House. Eleanor had talked about her voice in a column and said, you know, singing, um, hearing Marian Anderson singing Schubert, Save Maria is like sitting in the lap of God. And after the concert, Eleanor went July 4th, 1939 to Richmond, the capital of the Confederacy, where she gives Marian Anderson the Spring Arn Medal and gives um, a speech on the, um, in, um, in non-confrontational terms about the horror that unequal education inflicts on the United States. So in many ways to me, the backstory of Marian Anderson is how this extraordinary woman got the courage to come up and shift from being um, an artist to a symbol, which she knew absolutely she was gonna become. She was terrified of doing it. I talked with her before she died. And the courage that she took with the support that she got from Eleanor, the friendship that developed about that, the phone calls, the letters that went back and forth together really is a phenomenal story. And it does my heart good to know that when Dr. King stood on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, that he stood on the exact same spot. And in my lexicon, the two angels that sat on his shoulder were Marion and Eleanor. So we did it, FDR and civil rights in 20 minutes. We really did it. See, I did it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sure. Come we can on, stay up here every minute. Okay. Okay. So as promised, we'll now see a, a film clip uh, from the newsreels of that time. We can watch. Uh, nation's most impressive Easter demonstration, 75,000 mass before Lincoln Memorial to hear Marian Anderson, colored contralto, make her capital debut at the Great Emancipator Shrine. Refusal of the DAR to let her use their hall fanned a countrywide controversy with this great gathering as the climax. The singer was invited by Secretary of the Interior, Ickes, who attends with Secretary of the Treasury, Morgenthau. Spectators include Supreme Court Justice Black, New York Senator Robert Wagner, and a host of notables, here to listen to the voice acclaimed by many as the finest in a century.
think of a nicer way to open our conference. Oh so God. feel free to stretch your legs. Let me cry. You know? um, and, uh, but we're going to try to start uh, the next panel in literally four or five minutes. So uh, we're just going to bring some chairs up and bring our next group of panelists up.